All right, hello everyone. I'm Tom, and since this coronavirus disruption started, I've been hosting this vlog to eat beef jerky and connect across the internet. Today I'll eat beef jerky and tell you how it tastes, and that's silly and pointless. I'll also talk about game design with a new topic every episode. Why not? Here it is, June 24th, coming up to the end of June. Uh, I hope everybody's staying safe and being reasonably happy, but um, there's too many people losing their jobs, and that just disappoints and distresses me. I'm fine. I work for myself, and I work from home, so, and my wife is also fine, so it's not me, but still in general, this economy sucks, and it's not going to get better right away. And that's really awful and bad, and I feel for everybody. But let's not be all downers. Let's be cheerful and interesting. <laughs> hey, here's something that I find interesting. So this is an image from a game called Bravely Default. Actually, technically, it's from an upcoming sequel called Bravely Default 2. But more specifically, the point is, is you know, Bravely Default. Bravely Default came out on the Nintendo 3DS and was a huge hit, despite being a, a despite being something that was from the beginning designed to be a throwback. It was it was an homage. It was uh, you know, old school RPG. And by old school, what do I really mean? I mean turn based. Um, from the beginning of RPGs, RPGs have been turn-based. If you set the clock back as far as it will go to the beginning of computer games, um, role-playing games, games inspired by Dungeons and Dragons, have been uh, games where you know you 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 hit the monster with a sword, and then they hit you with a sword or a claw, and then you hit the monster with the sword again, and they hit you, and, and so on and so forth, until somebody falls down and dies. That's been the basic combat mechanic. Why? Because it's the basic combat mechanic of Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Like, like the blues is the fundamental root of all rock music. So Dungeons and Dragons is the fundamental root of all role-playing games, and especially computer role-playing games. A fundamental group, um, which is why if you can find a computer role-playing game that is not inspired in any way by Dungeons and Dragons, that's a pretty radical, rare thing. Uh, but anyways, getting back to this, it, I think it's interesting for a couple of reasons. First off, well, you know, it, it was very popular and uh, it was on the 3DS, which not a lot of people play, but now the sequel sometime this year shall come out on the Nintendo Switch. So I'm kind of looking forward to that, but, you know, um, and I'm working on some kind of light RPG projects of my own right this very second, so I'm interested in RPGs and RPG stories and RPG game mechanics. Um, and, uh, and this was kind of interesting because of its, you know, deep turn-based game play, um, and, and how, uh, what I had read is that uh, when it came out, it exceeded all expectations of its popularity, uh, and people feel that the the the, uh, the executives at the companies who made it uh, expected that action-oriented uh, hack and slash um, action games were more what the kids wanted, and therefore the turn-based game was you know old and busted. And to their great surprise, it was a very popular. Uh, products, so they were forced to reevaluate what they thought of as turn-based versus, you know, real-time action games. Um, and I think, to me, that speaks of the fact that uh, our video game industry globally is huge. It's so big. It's literally bigger than all movies. Uh, movies have not made as much money as video games for many years now. Uh, video games are big, and they're everywhere, and and part of the thing is, you know, the truth is, is that Hollywood makes movies in a very specific format, with a very specific screen ratio, 
two hour to three hour running, one and a half to three hour running time depending. The sweet spot is supposed to be at just shy of two hours. Um, and, uh, you know, it has very specific patterns. You get credits at the end, credits at the beginning. You know, there's all these tropes that we so take for granted. And, um, and of course, Hollywood takes that for granted, even though somebody's going to be watching Avengers Endgame um, in the theater, they're going to be watching it at home on their TV, they're going to be watching it on a bootleg video on their laptop, they're going to be watching it on their phones, they're going to be watching it you know, everywhere they can. So, you know, the, the truth is that the people define a format and then, or, or people who make something define a format and then the people who consume it go ahead and consume it whichever way works for them. Um, why am I blabbing about this? I'm simply saying that the video game industry has gotten so big that even something that is considered very niche has a large audience. Doesn't matter how niche you have, used to be, I would say, as an indie game developer, that no matter what you made, you were guaranteed five people would, would write to you and say, boy, I really like that game you made. Five people. That was it. You get five people for free. Uh, and now, in 2020, I'm forced to think that that number is actually far bigger, because the, the, the whole pie is bigger. There's just more room for more video games and more consumers of video games than ever before. So I'm not at all surprised that Bravely Default has old school game mechanics that are still wildly popular because there's just so many people who want to play games in general. You're going to find your market, theoretically. Certainly a big company like that is going to find their market. And I guess the other, the other thing that I wanted to say about Bravely Default and you know, modern day RPGs uh, is that uh, as I've been reading about Bravely Default, I've been learning that it really has some really interesting innovative tweaks. Uh, like for instance, um, when you're playing and running around like any RPG, you get uh, random battles in, and most people, oh, I hate those. Well, Bravely Default solves the problem simply by letting, giving you a slider bar. You can have 100%, 50%, 23%, or 0% random battles which means that if you don't want to be bothered on your way to the big boss, you drag it down to 0% and you don't get any random battles. And if you want to grind in a specific area, you go to that area and drag it up to 100% take two steps. So, uh, so simple, so brilliant. Fixes so much. Uh, the other thing that, that Bravely Default does as a, as a little tweak is it has, you know, all the little battle animations and um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the normal turn-based combat, which can be slow. So it just gives you a slider bar so that you can adjust the combat speed overall. So if you want to go to play the whole thing in 400 times combat speed, boom, 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 you're welcome to. It just doesn't, you know, it's just a speed adjustment. Um, so I, I, I have yet to get into Bravely Default. I know that the people who did it moved over and did a game called Octopath Traveler which many of my friends played and truly enjoyed. Um, so, you know, they seem to know what they're doing and they're having a lot of fun making that and people are having fun playing that. Uh, yeah, so that's what I wanted to say about Bravely Default. Now, let's talk about jerky. I've been dipping into my bag of just odd weirdo beef jerkies and what we have today is People's Choice Beef Jerky garlic and ginger, or just garlic ginger. So this is going to be a weird one. I don't know how hot it's going to be, but I know it's going to be weird. So why don't we get to it? Garlic, ginger, people's choice, if I can get the bag open. Come on, Mr. Bag, don't fight me. It's not, uh, you're, you're not designed to stop me from eating. You're trying to help me eat. Right? Isn't that the deal? Alright. It's got little uh, sesame seeds all over it. It's advertising the fact that it's uh, jerky. It tastes, uh, smells like jerky, so. I taste the garlic, I taste the ginger. 
there was a piece of that that tasted almost or, or had the was uh, not tough. It was almost like a fatty piece. Though it might have been maybe the covering. But interesting though. Uh, definitely taste the garlic, taste the ginger. Waiting to be kicked in the mouth by the heat. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, yeah. I would say a little bold, a little oddball. Yeah. Alright. If we crack open the mailbag, Adam Para has once again, as he has never failed us, he did not fail us again this time. Last time, uh, I, uh, I, I, I uh, responded to his re previous reply about Godzilla, and he's, he writes, Thanks for explaining the relationship. I knew they really reused footage. I wasn't sure to what extent. So I'm thinking about having another uh, tricky thing where I talk about A.J. Subaraya. But, and while that's a very interesting topic, the, 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 the essentially the godfather of Godzilla, um, I think that in terms of reuse of footage, yes, uh, a lot of the cheaper giant monster movies reuse footage. In fact, the Gamera series, not made by Toho, but by its competitor, Dai Studios, um, was famous for padding out their bad Gamera movies with footage from the previous Gamera movies. Oh, it got bad. And each Gamera movie essentially was made on a cheaper budget than the last until it just got bad. I mean, it was bad, bad, but now it's bad, bad, bad. Uh, Gamera's famous for that. Uh, at least in the in the Showa era, the old you know black and white at 60s, 70s era. Um, Godzilla, you reused some footage, but not that much. Um, and I don't know that the that the, the special appearance he made in uh, an Ultraman style show, uh, Zone Fighter, that's the actual name of the show that he had a, uh, a cameo in an episode of Zone Fighter. It's Ultraman. Uh, or early days. Um, and the reason for that is again because a guy in a suit back in those days was actually pretty cheap and easy to do and in truth, it was all one big company doing it all anyway, and that was Subaraya Productions. AJ Subaraya was a giant, and his studio was a giant. If somebody was making a show and needed a rubber-suited monster, they went straight to him, and there was nobody else in Japan to go to for all of its purposes. So what I'm trying to say is, is that you may think Godzilla footage was liberally reused, uh, not, not always, and that's because Godzilla suits weren't hard to come by and weren't expensive to use. Um, it's just, you know, it's just how it was. Uh, so, at any rate, it's, you know, it's, uh, yeah. He, uh, Adam also writes, You being 8th level Godzilla fan are space monsters and Artemis because of your love of God giant monsters. And I have to say, Adam, know that my... The, the, the space monsters in Artemis are because of my love of whales. And obviously whales being as big as they are, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of crossover in my psyche between giant monsters and whales. But the bottom line is, is that the, the space whales in Artemis came first. And they came first because my muse said, you know, you could make some beautiful, interesting space whales in your video game, and they were the first monsters I put in, um, and they weren't actually very interactable. And they were kind of designed not to be very interactable. They were supposed to be, my vision of them was a vision of, of beauty and uh, harmlessness and fragility, but everybody loved them, and I had code for months, or, or for, for whales, so it just made sense to me that they, people would want more than just whales. So after I did the whales, for the reasons I did the whales, because I love whales, I then also expanded the game to have another half dozen monsters. So that's that's the story of how monsters came to be in the heart of us. It wasn't really because of Godzilla, it was more because of I like whales. So, alright, well, 
we ate, and by that I mean I ate, People's Choice beef jerky garlic ginger. And I found it weird and bold, but not really offensive or anything. And it wasn't as surprisingly hot as I as it could have been. I mean, which is to say it could have snuck up on me and been hotter than I wanted. Um, so, interesting. Alright, that's it for today. I appreciate you stopping by and watching. So, catch you next time. And hey, if you, if you want to be notified whenever I make one of these videos, you've got to click the little bell button on YouTube. That's what allows you to get notified so that, you know, hey, I just Tom made a new video. I guess I'll watch it. If you want that, click the little bell button. That's what it's all about. All right, I'll see you next time.